And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Welcome to the God's Peculiar People podcast, where we learn about the lives and characteristics of God's people. In the last episode, we looked at the conversion of Saul, later to be called the Apostle Paul. And today we're going to look at the first missionary journey and the second missionary journey, but we got to look at how they were sent out to begin with. So Paul was not sent out on his own to go minister in other parts of the world. He was sent out with Barnabas to begin with, and we find that in Acts chapter 13, verses uh, 1 through 3. And they didn't go out because they said, hey, we want to go. It was a little bit different in that the Lord spoke to those who were in charge at the church at Antioch and told them, hey, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, to go do this work that I have called them to do. Here in the beginning, we see God telling the church which members were to go and minister. Now, this is different today. People will often feel a call of God to go to the mission field, and they will approach their pastor or someone in leadership and tell them, hey, I think this is what God wants me to do, and then things will proceed from there. But in this first instance instance of a missionary being sent out, we see that it is God calling for Barnabas and Saul to be separated and to go minister to him. So where did they go? So they left the church of, of Antioch. So the first missionaries did not go out of Jerusalem. They went out of Antioch. Now, of course, Philip, the apostles, they went into other areas. But the first time that we really refer to people as missionaries are here with Barnabas and Saul because they're coming out of the established church that was started in Antioch and going into other parts. So this first missionary journey is believed to have been, I'm seeing conflicting dates, um, but I see from like 45 AD to 49 AD. We don't know the exact timeline, but that appears to be what is considered the length of this missionary journey. And so they went out of the church in Antioch. They went to the island of Cyprus. They went to Salamis. They were at Paphos. They went to Pamphylia, Pisidia, and Iconia. And where else did they go here? They went to Iconium, to Lystra, and Derby, And then they retraced their steps from Derby. They returned to Lystra, Iconium, and then went back to Antioch to report back to the church. So that's their direction. So if you have a map, you can follow along with that. They begin at the island of Cyprus, trace their way around, and then they come back the same way, going back to encourage the people that they had met along the way as they go back to Antioch. And they've reported back to the church, which is something we still see today. Missionaries come home on furlough, and they go to the churches that have supported them and report on what God has done. And you know, it's not just for accountability, I guess is the word we want to use. Accountability, that missionaries are doing what they say that they've done, but also it's an encouragement to the churches that they can hear stories directly from the missionaries. Like, you've been supporting them for several years, maybe, and now you get to verbally hear from them and see what God has done. Maybe see a video presentation, which is, which is awesome, great to be able to do. And even though missionaries send back letters, they missionaries send back letters, but it's not the same as verbally hearing from that missionary, uh, seeing and hearing their emotion, uh, seeing and hearing what God has done from them. It makes a bigger impact, and that's why it's important if you have missionaries coming through who are on furlough to go and hear what they have to say, what has God done in their lives and the ministry that God has sent them to do. So along the pathway of this first missionary journey, we see some things change. And we see that beginning in chapter 13. So up to this point, we've seen it be referred to as a Barnabas and Saul throughout. It's Barnabas and Saul. And then it changes when we get to chapter 13, verse 9. And there we see that then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. We'll go back to that part in just a moment. But from this part forward, this verse 9, when Saul's name changes to Paul, we see it transition to it being Paul and Barnabas. And then people who'd go with him afterwards, Paul and Silas, Paul and Timothy, his name always comes first. For the most part, there's a couple exceptions, but for the most part in things following, it is Paul and then whoever is with him. But this first instance, what what is happening? So they're on the island of Cyprus and there is a sorcerer, that's what the Bible says, sorcerer named Elymas, who is trying to distract the deputy of the country whose name is Sergius Paulus, who is a prudent man. Barnabas and Saul were trying to speak with him. He desired to hear the word of God, but Elymas was trying to withstand them, seeking to turn the deputy away from the faith. And it's at this point that 
we read that, that Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of, of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking the sum to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. So we see, I don't want to say Paul's first convert, but we see the first convert of a missionary is Sergius Paulus, the deputy of the country of Cyprus. Now I miss back in verse 5 that we see that they had John also to their minister. This was John Mark. And so we see this great excitement, this great high. We've had our first person converted, the first person to believe on our missionary journeys. But then very shortly afterwards, they're in Cyprus and they, they went to Pamphylia and there John departed from them to return to Jerusalem. So he made it a little ways, a, a short, maybe, maybe a year, six months. We don't know the timeline. We know it's very short amount of time compared to how long they were gone. John Mark departed, returned back to Jerusalem and they continued on. And then we see something that starts and continues throughout Paul's ministry. The fact that when he goes into a new place, the first thing that he will do is that he will go into the synagogue, typically on the Sabbath days, what we read, and he will sit down and he will read of the law and the prophets. He will go first to the Jews to declare unto them the truth of their Messiah, the one that they are expecting, the one that they're waiting for. And he will go and share the good news with them first. And then, as what happens continually throughout, Paul would be rebuffed. They would, you know, we don't want to hear what you have to say. We're not interested. And then he would turn and direct his attention towards the Gentiles. He would make sure the Jews had their opportunity to hear. He would go to where they were to share the good news. But then when they didn't want it, instead of didn't force it down their throat and keep coming back and back and back trying to argue with them or fight with them. But then he went on and told the Gentiles as well. And many times they were very eager and willing to hear, whereas the Jews, especially, uh, it says in verse 50 of chapter 13, but the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coast. And you, you would think this was discourage Paul and Barnabas, but it says in, in verses 51 and 52, but they shook off the dust of their feet against them and came unto Iconium. So they weren't discouraged. It was like, hey, you, you don't want to hear? We're going to keep moving on. We'll, we'll go on. And then chapter 14, Verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Long time therefore abode they, speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace, and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. The multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part with the apostles. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers, to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were aware of it, and fled unto Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconium, and unto the region that lieth round about. And there they preached the gospel. When the city and its inhabitants was like, we're not interested. Get out of here. They didn't stay and force the issue. They moved on. Done here. We have, it says at the beginning that some believed, Jews and Gentiles, some believed. But then it's like, okay, well, we're not getting any farther. Move on to the next place. They just kept moving on, moving on, moving on. And so that's the first missionary journey. It's just going, sharing, being rebuffed, saying we don't want you, and moving on. So the end of the first missionary journey, they return to Antioch. They're sharing the good news, but there's something happening conference in Jerusalem. And so the church sends Paul and Barnabas as their representatives to go to Jerusalem. We're not going to get into that whole conference. Paul and Barnabas was sent back to Antioch and with them came a fellow named Judas and a man named Silas. They being prophets also themselves and they exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. They were sent from Jerusalem to kind of help encouraged the church at Antioch, both Judas and Silas. Silas decided to stay there in Antioch, and it says that Paul also and Barnabas continu continued in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. So there's many people there in Antioch working. And then it says in chapter 15, verses 36 through 41, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. 
And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended of the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. So we see this confrontation between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas has the task of mentoring younger Christians. This is what he did with Paul. He went and sought out Paul to bring him to where the work was. He was the one who, when others had rejected Paul, he said, come with me. And he helped him and encouraged him. And it's sad that Paul in this moment did not see that, did not see that John Mark was given a second chance. Now, the difference might be that Paul was wanting to do, you know, he was being the one being rebuffed by the apostles and he wanted to go to the work. He hadn't left the work. He was just rebuffed by the apostles. And Barnabas came and said, hey, come on, let me grab you by the shoulder. You can come work with me. Um, so there's a difference in the narrative a little bit, but we see that Barnabas is the one who is willing to take the younger Christian under his, under his wing and help them, to help them so that the apostles will listen to them and uh, respect them and to help them mature and grow. You know, we miss that with Barnabas, you know, what he did for Paul, how God used him in Paul's life. And it's, it's disappointing that Paul didn't catch that in this moment. We know later on that Paul thought that John Mark was profitable for, to him for the ministry. But at this point in Paul's life, he did not see John Mark as useful to the labor or trustworthy in the labor and so did not want him. And so this caused a contention between Paul and Barnabas to the point where they could not work together. And so they went separate ways. Now, this isn't bad. You have two men who are filled with the Holy Ghost and yes, together, who knows what could have happened if they'd worked together, but separately as well, they were able to take the gospel to other places. So it's not a terrible thing. It's disappointing, but it's not a terrible thing. But it's, it's a good point to remember that sometimes someone else can see something in a person that we don't see because of where we're standing. And some people have that talent and that gift of helping to encourage and raise people up where others are just more factual. It's like, hey, I'm here to teach, 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 teach. If you want to learn from me, grab onto my coattails and I'll teach you as we go. But Barnabas was more, let me, let me put my arm around you. You come with me and, and I will, I'll help. And Paul just, he didn't see that at the time, but they separate. Paul picks up Silas, who is a great help, a great encouragement to him. And they go and begin their journeys. Now for the second missionary journey, it's believed to have run from 51 AD to 54 AD. And the regions that they were to have traversed through are the regions of Asia Minor, Macedonia, and Achaia. And so for that, they went through Derby, Lystra, Phrygia, Galatia, Mysia, Troas. They went to the, the cities we know of, and some of them we can still see today, Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. And then from Corinth, they returned by way of Ephesus, Ephesus to Jerusalem, and then from Jerusalem to Antioch. There's just so many ways to look at this with, with Paul's life. There's so many ways we could um, break down these missionary journeys, but we're the God's Peculiar People podcast. So I want to focus a little bit for just a moment on who the people were that Paul came across in his second missionary journey. So, so I made a list, not exhaustive, just quickly the ones people I could find. These are the people that Paul interacted with by name, people we have names for, or a really good description, longer description of them during his second missionary journey. So we have, of course, Silas, we have a Timotheus, we have Lydia, we have that certain damsel in Acts 16. We have the jailer in Acts 16. There are the Bereans. There's Dionys and Damaris. There's Aquila and Priscilla. There's Justus, Crispus, Erastus, Gallius, and Aristarchus are mentioned on his second missionary journey. So let's talk briefly about, let's talk about two of them. I, there's, there's so many we could talk about, but let's just talk about two of them. Let's talk about the Philippian jailer. So Paul and Silas were preaching in the city of Philippi. Beautiful city, by the way. If you ever have a chance to go to Greece, go to the ancient city of Philippi. You know, the ruins of an ancient Greek city. It was beautiful, beautiful place to visit. Um, we went in the winter times when I was there, but it was beautiful. So if you ever have a chance, that would be amazing to go visit. Anyhow, <laughs> Back on track. Paul and Silas, they were arrested because this um, woman who had a spirit, she kept following them around, calling out, uh, these men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. So the spirit within her was speaking truth, but Paul, it, it started to um, upset them. It says, Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And then 
their masters were upset because the hope of their gains were gone. They were using her as a, like a soothsayer, a fortune teller, and they were slightly upset. And so they had Paul and Silas arrested. It says in verse 22, And the multitude rose up against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and command to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safe. And we know that at midnight, Paul and Silas, having been beaten in jail, falsely accused, prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners who were in the prison also heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his straightway. And when he had brought them into this house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. So we see this situation that to many of us, being falsely accused, being arrested, beaten, put thrown in jail. That's not something pleasant. That is not something we would enjoy. But we see that Paul and Silas, even in the midst of persecution, this false accusation, they were still willing to sing praise and honor God at midnight. And God honored their faithfulness by shaking that prison, opening the doors. They could have escaped, but they didn't escape. And by them not escaping, by them, this is, this is where we were supposed to be. This is what has happened. We're going to just stay here. They were able to share the gospel with the Philippian jailer. And we have that famous question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And the simple, simplistically simple answer of believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Anyone who, who wants to tell you that works are required for salvation, that you have to follow the rules or some do some good works or give so much money or go to church all, all the time, or confess your sins to a priest. That's not the case. It is as simple as Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That's it. There's nothing else that has to be done. But to believe on who Jesus is, the fact that he died for your sins, and that's it. It's that simple. It's so sad that we have made it so complicated and so difficult and so many rules you have to follow and so people are so fearful because they don't know. And we have complicated it, the gospel, and it's very frustrating to see that because it is so simple. Now, the Philippian jailer believed. There's other stories here that happen in between, but let's go on quickly to verse 18. Paul is in has departed from Athens and he's come to Corinth and he found a certain Jew named Aquilus, born in Pontius, lately come from Italy, and his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for they by their occupation were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So Paul remained in Corinth for a year and six months. So he was there for 18 months teaching the word of God among the people. It appears from what it says, uh, they were the same occupation, they were tent makers, that Paul would have worked, uh, done his craft with them while he was at Corinth. And we read later that he will, they will travel with him to Ephesus. I believe that they stay there and then they meet Apollos and they encourage him as well. So we, we see them being encouragers, people who uh, allow the person to come into their home, missionary to come into their home, allow him to work with them, stay with them. You know, but they were learning from him at the same time. I'm sure there were some amazing conversations that might have happened as they were hand stitch a tent together. So imagine the conversations that might have happened as they were sitting there working together. That would have been a, a very interesting, very enjoyable to have been a fly on the wall and heard those conversations at that time. So on this second missionary journey, Paul accomplished a few things. So he encouraged churches in Syria, Cilicia, Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch. And he also established churches in places like Philippi, Thessalonica, Berea, Athens, and Corinth. It feels like maybe he may, did one in Ephesus as well. I am not positive on that. It seems like he kind of passed through Ephesus at that time. But I'm not sure that we read of a, of a church necessarily being established at that moment in Ephesus. I'll have to double check on that. But we see the beginning of many long lasting relationships with 
Timothy, with Aquila and Priscilla, with Silas. And this journey helps us know the geography of the world at that time as well. Where, where places are, gives us an idea of how long it took to travel between places. But that is all we have time for today. Next week, we'll come back. We'll talk about the third missionary journey. And then I'm realizing that we may have to turn this into a four-part series. Uh, I have an idea for that fourth episode. So probably another week of Paul after that. So two more weeks. Hopefully that's okay. But thank you for listening to the God's Peculiar People podcast. We'll talk to you guys next time. <laughs>